one, to discuss the reputation, character, physical condition, or mental health rather than professional competence of an individual. And then later on in the meeting, we'll be discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a det detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body in the chair, so declares. So is there a motion to go into executive so, session? So moved. Second. Yes. 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 Okay. Women, did you get your water? Yes, I I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll begin the meeting with a moment of silence. And we'll still keep in our in our thoughts and prayers the Menard family from from Worcester. This meeting is being recorded and televised by the local cable company. Is there a motion to approve bill and payroll warrants? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the motion to accept correspondence in the read file? <coughs> so moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Public forum, now is the time for anyone to talk if it's on an item that's not on the agenda. Approval of meeting minutes, open session October 22nd, 2019. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. One abstention. We have two scheduled hearings, uh, hearings uh, coming up. The first is a public hearing for the purpose of determining a residential factor to be applied in calculating the percentages of the tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property for FY2020. You're on. All right, this shouldn't take uh, so long. Um, so Candy, if you'd like to have a seat there, you're welcome. I prefer that. Yes. <laughs> so, did you all receive your uh, packets in the mail? Uh, hopefully, you had a chance to uh, take a peek at them. The crux of the matter is the um, third page, which is the uh, long spreadsheet uh, that exemplifies. Uh, the scenario that we need to look at um, tonight. So um, prior to submitting the proposed uh, fiscal 20 tax rate into the Department of Revenue for approval, it is the obligation of the Board of Assessors to illustrate to the Board of Selectmen the effects of shifting the tax rate from the residential classes to the commercial, industrial, and personal property uh, classes. So if you, if you have the sheet in front of you in the upper left-hand corner, it uh, divides out the valuation by class. So it shows the value of the residential, the commercial, the industrial, and the personal property. Uh, and we see that the Department of Revenue has approved a valuation of uh, 1717572000 uh, 100,470. Um, so that's already been established. So uh, that's a given. Uh, in the box below it, it shows a levy that we have determined to be 27,240,699. So the only variable that leaves is the tax rate, which has been um, estimated to be $15.86 per 1,000 evaluation. However, uh, there are two options that would affect the way the tax rate could possibly be shifted. Um, and the Board of Selectmen has the option to adopt either one of these uh, options. So the first option is a residential exemption. Um, and the residential exemption is um, an exemption which allows a shift of the tax burden within the residential class away from the lower valued single family homes to higher valued single family homes, multi family properties, apartment buildings, and non resident property owners. But this exemption is typically adopted in communities that have a high percentage of rental properties 
which is not the case here in Whitman, and the Board of Assessors has voted not to recommend this particular option. The second option is a small commercial exemption, and what that would do is shift the tax burden from parcels occupied by small businesses to those occupied by other commercial and industrial taxpayers. The eligible small businesses may have an average of no more than 10 employees, so we're talking a small business. Um, the problem with this option is that it is the real estate owner that would enjoy the exemption and not so much the small business. So, um, and for the small businesses in Whitman, the majority of them are businesses that are run through their, you know, homes. So the Board of Assessors made the vote not to uh, adopt that option. So bearing in mind, or using the um, scenario that we are not going to enlist either one of those options, the table below just shows um, the shift in increments of 5% away from the residential towards the commercial, industrial, and personal. And just at the end section of that column, it just shows that uh, we're starting out with the tax rate of $15.86 across the board. If we lowered the residential to 1577. The commercial, industrial, and personal would shift up to 1665, no, no. so on and so forth. Um, but back to the box that's showing the breakdown of class, um, residential uh, accounts for 89.5% of the total valuation. The commercial, industrial, and personal combined only make up 10% of the total valuation, and it is for this, you know, reason that the Board of Assessors feels that, you know, placing an unfair burden on this small uh, percentage of commercial that we already have would be unfair um, and not really suit the purpose. So, um, what the Board of Assessors needs from the Board of Selectmen is a vote to be taken um, on, you know, either not adopting or not adopting either one of the options and then you know whether you want to maintain a single tax rate or opt for either one of these shifts. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, at what percentage of commercial um, amount of tax base would you consider percentage wise to where it would start to make a significant difference in relief for the tax for the residential tax base? Well we find uh, in um, the communities and within Plymouth County certainly that you have to be up around 20 percent commercial in order for people to uh, consider it. So you know, communities like Hanover, mm -hmm. Avon, right. Braintree, they do well with that because mm -hmm. the commercial component can absorb the higher tax. Sure. So the more business we um, lure to Whitman would be the you, You'd probably you know, want to consider it yeah. more so if the uh, portion were up around 20%. Right. Great. Thank you. If I'm reading this correctly, um, what it says is to save any any individual homeowner owner ten dollars, you'd have to raise business taxes by a hundred. It's basically a ten to one ratio yeah. there. Yep. Right. Yes. That's okay. right. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Mm. At current. Yes. Makeup. Yeah. Right. Mm. Right. So the rec the recommendation is to uh, exercise neither of the options and to remain a one to one ratio Factor as far as the tax rate is concerned. <clears throat> Would someone like to make a motion? I will make that motion that we maintain the uh, single uh, tax rate of, uh, what is it, factor of one? Yes. Okay. So I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion? All right. And one last thing that we do need to do uh, using these numbers, we're going to submit this into the de uh, Department of Revenue tomorrow to get the tax rate approved. But it is the obligation of the Board of Assessors to let the Board of Selectmen know, as the numbers stand right now, the excess levy capacity for fiscal 2020 is $3,982.63. Different than in Close. previous years. <laughs> yeah, right. very tight. Right. And that'll maintain uh, a tax rate of 1586. That's, that's what we're hoping to, that's what we're submitting for approval. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Yep. And so the uh, average single family, I think that was in the last page of your packet, I gave a couple of examples. For the average single family, that would increase their yearly tax bill by $304 per year. That's just a two and a half percent increase over last year. Well, it's two and a half plus the, the, the debt exclusion. Oh, yeah. Plus the debt exclusion. So it went up 1.9 million. Gotcha. Well, so the tax rate went up, but also did the um, the assessed value it's also went up. Now. That's correct. What was the average? Three. Yeah. So I think it's it's in your packet, and it's on um, I think items of interest, the last page, uh, <clears throat> Randy. Oh, okay. So 304 for the average and um, 309 for the median, single family. Yeah. Okay. You ready to vote? Yeah. All those in favor of the, um, the Board of Assessors recommendations? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, Kathy, yes. you'll have the uh, numbers entered tomorrow so I can print the LA5. Uh, the LA5. Five. Five. Yep, so um, I think all that has to happen now is Don Bali just has to certify that we've had the meeting and so it can be submitted tomorrow. So tomorrow I will have a prepared Form LA-5 in the office for selectman signatures that ultimately has to go in to set the tax rate where you acknowledge what the excess levy is and the factor is one. <coughs> when does that have to be signed by, Frank? Uh, hopefully within a week. Okay. The sooner we get it in, the sooner the tax rate gets approved. So that would be wonderful. Thank you. And we're going to play musical chairs for a minute. And Lisa's going to take Frank's place at the, at the table because we're about to have a public hearing pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 140, Section 157, and Whitman's Dog Control Regulation, 27, Section 11, with respect to a complaint filed by Leslie and Michael Leary of 58 Forest Street against a dog that's allegedly owned or harbored by Jill Barton of 66 Forest Street. And Lisa will, uh, she will chair a hearing, a public hearing about this, this matter. Mr. Chairman, I would ask for the benefit of minutes that when you begin the hearing, each person identify themselves by name and address. You can handle that, right, Lisa? Mm -hmm. It's yours. Good evening. We are here this evening to conduct a um, dangerous dog hearing as requested by a resident of Far Street. Um, the residents are concerned about some aggressive behavior exhibited by two dogs of another resident of Far Street. Um, if the residents are here, would you please identify yourselves and your address? And you are? And your address? Thank you. Um, Leslie Leary at 58 Forest Street. Thank you. Michael Leary, 58 Forest Street. Are you here for the hearing? Yes. And I'm Sue Donofrio, 57 Forest Street. Okay. Sue Donofrio, 57 Forest Street. Okay. Roswell, 65 Forest Street. Thank you. Okay, just oh. to give a little background on the situation. Um, oh, Lisa, okay. also present is our assistant. Oh. Evening Animal Control Officer. My apologies. <clears throat> so, um, Mr. Kenny is our one of our ACOs, and he is here as well um, for, to participate in the hearing. Um, just to give a little background, um, we have some residents of Forest Street who have um, expressed extreme concern about two dogs uh, who reside at 66 Forest Street. Um, there have been reports of some aggressive behavior. Um, the dogs have been allowed to um, leave the home and roam the street unleashed, where they have been um, reported to have bitten two children unprovoked. Um, a second dog, there is a report uh, in the quarantine of, again, biting another resident. Um, 
all of these actions have happened off of the dog owner's properties and on other folks' properties. Um, we have received a request, a formal request for a dangerous dog hearing, and that's why we're all here. Um, under Mass General Law, Chapter 50, 157, 140, um, Section 157, um, towns are allowed to have to identify and determine whether dogs are considered dangerous dogs or a nuisance type dog. And there's certain evidence that we look at and analyze to come to those determinations. Um, is there anyone that would like to stand up and, and just talk about their um, experience with the dogs? Sir, please step forward and use the microphone. And if, if you could identify yourself and your address when you first come to the mic, then the rest of you also. Hi, I'm Bob Wilhelm, 65 Forest Street. Uh, I've lived on uh, Forest Street since about 1988. And uh, this dog issue uh, has just occurred in this, this last year. My first uh, encounter with the dog, uh, the female owner was walking the dog on Forest Street and then taking it up and down uh, Ross Drive, which is abutting my property. To make a long story short, the dog, the dog exhibits uh, dangerous antisocial behavior. It seems to be fine with the owner, but as soon as someone that the dog doesn't know or recognize, it, it tenses up, starts barking and growling and pulling very strongly on, on his lead. She jerks it and, you know, and gets it back under control and then c continues on to the house. That doesn't happen just one time. It's happened several times this year. Thank you. Hello, I'm Leslie Leary. I live at 58 Forest Street. Um, I was the person, one of the people that requested this hearing. Um, what prompted my request was on July 3rd, my son, daughter, and dog were walking along the sidewalk when the smaller dog got loose and bit my son on the back of the upper thigh, causing a mark um, that looks like teeth and ripping his shorts. Um, during this event, uh, the owner of those dogs were out with both dogs. During that time, the German Shepherd was lunging and barking and snarling at us. Um, and then we had to cross the street going into Mr. Wilhelm's yard because the owner of, the, of those dogs were not able to get the smaller dog under control. So for safety, we went to Mr. Uh, Mr. Bob is what we call him, but um, we went to Bob's house where his yard was fenced in and we were out of sight of the dogs. I called the ACO and she came, escorted us back to the house. Um, during that time, uh, the owner of, the, of those dogs left the scene when she came back because she was unaccounted for. We had to call, or Laura Howe called Whitman police. Um, when she came back, I saw the German Shepherd lunging at Laura on the sidewalk, and she was a good distance away. Um, and then I witnessed the German Shepherd attack the little dog by picking him up in his mouth and then dropping him to the ground. And then, um, uh, but then beyond this event, it, the smaller dog has always been an issue. We've had multiple calls to Laura Howe in regards to this dog not being on leash. I've witnessed this dog um, run after a high school aged kid and biting his sneaker. You know, the dog has bit my husband in our yard, drawing blood on the back of his leg. Every incidence that we've had with this owner, we have brought up with her specifically. Now we've asked her to keep the dog on a leash. She said she would try, and it hasn't it hasn't happened. Um, so, you know, I I just and like this has been going on for so long, and the lack of concern that is exhibited by the owner, and on top of that, the dog's behaviors 
is disturbing. I've witnessed that German Shepherd lunge at joggers who then have to cross the street because it's not safe for them to walk on the sidewalk. After this, this incident on July 3rd with us, my kids didn't feel safe walking on the sidewalk up until mid-September. And walking to school and having to cross that street where there is no sidewalk and there are buses and kids coming, getting dropped off, it's a busy street, but it's not safe for anybody walking on that side of the road when those dogs are out. Because it's the lack of concern and the lack of just overall abidance by the leash law is disturbing. And you know, since that event, we've carried mace. We've, my son has been petrified to go to bed because he thinks that she's gonna let the dogs in the house when he's sleeping. This is like an ongoing thing for a long time. And when we saw the German Shepherd be brought home, we notified Laura Howe and let her know that this is a concern. She is unable to maintain leash laws with a smaller dog that can do much less damage. And you know, we let her know up until tonight that German Shepherd still is not licensed. And the, the Maltese that bit my son was not licensed when he bit my son. He was not licensed until a month later. So this is a concern. The dog's behavior is a concern, and the owner's callousness with just us, or the law in general, and responsible dog ownership is, is just as concerning. That's what I have to say. Hi, Michael Leary, 58 Forest Street. Um, it's a lot to unpack here. Like, I uh, echo all of my wife's concerns. Uh, this has been a, an ongoing issue for some time. Um, I don't know if, if the information that I sent ahead of time was shared with all of you, or I know Randy, you saw it, and I know Frank saw it. I don't know if all of you have seen it or not, so that can be provided if it hasn't already. <clears throat> But the, the calls started after we tried to work things out with her and just say, hey, you need to keep the dog in the leash. When the dog bit me in 2014, I said, you know, she was very apologetic and, you know, she certainly didn't mean to have her dog bite me. But I said, it's not going to be okay if it bites one of my kids. I have a small daughter. I have a son on the way. Like, this isn't going to be okay. And there was no action taken. Like, 5.30 in the morning to 11.30 at night, you could hear her going up and down the street saying, Andy, Andy. Like, she just didn't leash the dog at all. So then in 2018, when Andy charged at our house with our son out in the front yard, urinated on our property, and then ran back in, that's when we started to have the conversation with the ACO, because we felt like this was no longer in our control. It wasn't something that she was gonna listen to us about. So we said, fine, the next logical step for us is to call the ACO, that's what they do, they should be able to handle this. And I think that the ACO was very sympathetic and you know wanted to change things, but like I don't know how accountable she was ever held for any of this. So a lot of it, like, it's just hearsay. So like, we see the dog off the leash, we're gonna call. Like, she's not gonna get there by the time the dog's in the house, so it's already gone. So there was a lot of that that happened. In the call logs, there was over five hours of talk time to the ACO. Like, that's a ridiculous amount of time. And like, we're not friends with her. Like, we don't like, like, we're not chatting. Like, these are all concerns that we have about this dog, okay? So, you know, when you take into account the effort that we've put in to try to keep this under control, and then, you know, she's not listening to our concerns, she's not listening to the ACO's concerns, and then, you know, it continues to be a problem. So, after 
few months of the ACO working with her, the dogs were on a leash, okay? So like, that was a huge improvement. But like, not always on a leash. As of last month in October, she would still take the big dog down on a leash and hold the little dog in her hand, walk down the steps, put the little dog down, and then walk into her backyard. She has a hard time holding both dogs on a leash. The big dog is so strong that it pulls her back and forth, and she can't control both dogs. And again, when the dog bit my son, it was an accident. It slipped out of a leash, okay? But the thing is, like, it should have been in a harness. It should have been in a tighter leash. It should have been in a better thing. She's not taking the right kind of precautions to keep anybody safe who goes up and down that street. And we're most impacted by it because we live right next to her. We have small kids, and we don't have a fenced-in yard. So, you know, those dogs are very protective of Jill in that home. But those dogs don't know where the property line is. Those dogs will come into our yard and things like that. So Andy is the one who, the Maltese, that one has been all over the place for years. The bigger dog has not. The bigger dog has been on a leash, but very aggressive, barking, lunging. And now I don't know, I can just tell you what the ACO told us is that the shepherd had bit somebody. So I'm hoping that that can be cooperated. If not, we were given misinformation. But what I can tell you from Andy is that I know that I can attest that Andy bit me. Andy, there's a quarantine record from 2017 that Andy bit somebody else. There are, I can attest to at least two that I saw that I never reported. And again, this was my fault because I didn't think this was going to be a, as big of a deal as it has become. But I've seen somebody on a bike get attacked. I've seen a jogger come by, get attacked. The one my wife mentioned of the high school age boy that got bit on the shoe was attacked. My son was attacked. That's six that I can attest to that I know happened. And just like me, a lot of times a little dog bites somebody and you could be like, oh, it's a little dog's not a big deal and it's not reported so I'm honestly like wouldn't be surprised if it's double that number because people want to give them the benefit of the doubt but this dog is a danger if my son fell down it could have bit his face like he was four years old and the the just the lack of concern like my wife said is really concerning because like there's there was no apology like oh my gosh i'm so sorry my dog bit you guys again like it was just like it was our fault like somehow this was the quote was if it was any other family this wouldn't be a problem it is a problem because nobody wants to get bit. Everybody should be safe. The Conley School is on this street. So it is something that kids walk up and down this street. They're going to the ball field. They're going to the school. They're going to the after school programs, whatever it is. There's a lot of traffic on this street. And a lot of them are kids. And they, she needs to be held accountable. We can't do it. It doesn't seem like the ACO was able to do it. So that's why we're here today. We really feel that we need to have some kind of restrictions that she can actually abide to that will keep the neighborhood safe, keep our children safe. They need to be in an enclosed area. If they're outside, they should have a muzzle on if they're going to be biting people. There should be insurance so when somebody does you know, get bit, because I, my heart of hearts is that if nothing is done and there's no restrictions put on, somebody else will get hurt. And that's basically my concerns. Um, I, I don't know. Do you guys do follow-up questions afterwards? Do we just talk? Yes, we will. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, actually, Ms. Barton, um, I'm going to call. You'll you'll be able to speak after all of the other folks. Okay. Spoken, okay. <clears throat> Would you like to come up? <clears throat> hey, I'm Jim Donofrio, 57 Forest Street. Um, Andy has run across the street into my driveway and attacked my cat. He didn't hurt the cat. The cat's almost the same size as him. But he did run across the street, and I've seen him many times running across the street. I fear he's gonna get hit by a car, because he just runs all over the place. And as the other dog, I haven't had much interaction with that, but when I walk my dog, that dog is up in the uh, picture window, and he's aggressive, like he wants to come through the window. He's never jumped, he jumps on the window, the window's never broken, but I would have a concern with him coming through the window out when I'm walking my dog. That's all he wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Would you like to? 
Hi, Sue Donofrio, 57 Forest Street. Um, just want to kind of go to the character of my neighbors here. They're nice people. They're not trying to start a problem here. And the day that the dog bit her son, you know, I went across the street to make sure she was okay. And, you know, it's just, it's, I don't know. You could, you know, Jill's yelling things over across at the police that were called. I mean, that's just not a neighborly thing to do. They're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to keep their kiddos safe here, you know? And I've actually had to witness um, Leslie walk Georgia across the street past Bob's property over to my little stoop and walk over to their house because they're just not, she's afraid to walk by their house. So I just wanted to say I've seen that and you know, it's a shame that they couldn't work it out, but it's not working out. So, and that's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite our ACO Joe Kenny up um, to say a few words and, and talk about the situations he's encountered with the dog. Um, Joe Kenny, assistant ACO in Whitman, um, kind of representing for Laura Howe, who isn't here due to medical leave. Um, I haven't been present at any of the incidences uh, personally. I did go out in 2018 to issue a quarantine, which was on the Shepard Mix dog. Um, during that time, I was inside the house. Um, I wasn't outside, so I say that. Um, the dog did lunge at me, I think twice inside the house. Um, that is inside the house, so the dog is reacting as I'm an intruder. Get that. My concern would be that the dogs, both dogs have been, con in multiple cases, uh, been involved in issues. It's come up repetitively without change. And the proximity to the house, to an elementary school, is concerning. Um, my concern would be that it is a kid after school, those dogs get loose. And as an ACO, I know that when we get calls on that street, um, it's been such a prevalent issue that I worry about kids at the school, so the first place I go is to make sure that those dogs aren't near the school. Um, just because I know the background on the dogs, that would be my concern. I would recommend and my recommendation would be to put some kind of restrictions on the dog um, to make sure that proper containment and restrictions are put on them to keep the public generally safe. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Um, before I ask Ms. Ba Ms. Braden to come up and speak, uh, I'd just like to offer some information le on the legal um, issues regarding this. Um, we do have documentation of three quarantines for the dogs. There's two dogs. Uh, one is a male Maltese, about 10 years old, um, and the second is the German Shepherd uh, mix, and I'm unaware of the um, age of that dog. But we do have two incidences where the Maltese did bite um, a, a child. We had one was a 17-year-old, and then one was the four-year-old. Um, I do have a picture of the bite mark that I do want to share with the Board of Selectmen. <clears throat> In the town of Whitman, we do have bylaws. Uh, we have bylaw number 27, which is dog control regulations. There are copies up here on the table. Um, under our dog, under the regulations, uh, folks are required to keep dogs on leashes when they're walking on public streets. Uh, they are required to license the dogs, which requires rabies vaccinations. Um, and basically, under, this, under these bylaws, um, there is a leash bylaw that is 21B. So all of these are, are outlined in our bylaws. Um, we do have a report that the female dogs, the mixed breed shepherd, Scarlet, at this point is not licensed. So it is unknown whether the dog has um, had its rabies vaccinations or not. 
um, under the Mass General Law Section 140, 157, um, basically we have two different types of dogs for these hearings to classify and determine. One is a dangerous dog. Um, under the definition of the Mass General Law, a dangerous dog is considered without justification attacks a person or a domestic animal causing physical injury. So we have, we have that um, portion. Uh, we have the do dogs that behave in a manner that is reason a reasonable person would believe possessing an, an unjustified imminent threat of physical injury. We have evidence of that. Um, based on that information, um, okay. I'm now going to ask Ms. Braden to come up, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Barden to come up and basically say a few words and um, talk about the situation. <laughs> Jill Barden, I live at 66 Forest Street. Um, with respect to the, what you keep calling Shepherd Mix, Scarlet, um, my understanding is that under a mass statute, a nuisance hearing cannot be ordered for a dog solely based upon growling or barking. Um, all I've heard from Bob and them is that they don't like the barking and the growling. I don't think that they can really make a complaint on that basis. Scarlett has never been off leash, so that information should be very well known by now, but it seems to be getting missed. Um, I have never lost control of her. She did jump up on a boy once. She did not bite him. She scratched him on the arm. He did not report it. His mother did not report it. The boy went to the nurse at school to get a Band-Aid, and the nurse reported it. That is the only violation I've had with Scarlett. The family, I went and talked with the family. They were very apologetic. The boy was sorry he ever went to the nurse. His mother said his son was fine, it was not an issue. They love dogs and were embarrassed about the complaint. This is the one that you came to my house for. And you told me at that time that you have to treat a scratch like a bite. So while you might not like her barking, she has not done anything other than, and all dogs have jumped up on people. I mean, I mean that's not really, yes, she's hard to handle, but I do handle her. Scarlett attends Positive Dog in Boston. To say that I do nothing for this, these dogs is ridiculous. Um, we started with a different trainer at Five Rings in January. I got her in November. We started with a trainer at Five Rings in January. It didn't work out. Um, we were put on a waiting list for Positive Dog until August. Positive Dog is a two-time Boston Magazine winner for best dog training and five-time Boston A-list winner for number one best dog training. They train house pets, but they also train in certified therapy dogs. And one of Scarlett's favorite trainers is a consultant for a dog training for the Boston Police. Scarlett has done exceedingly well there. She's often the envy of the other dog owners. She's a top performer in the class. And as a matter of fact, I have a letter of reference from the owner of Positive Dog that I can provide for you. Just to clarify as well, we're, we're talking about the two dogs. I will get I to the other one. I'm only addressing one at a time. Okay. I, I understand that. But I just don't understand why we're going forward with a dog that has not met the requirement for a nuisance hearing. That determination has not been made yet. We're, we're in the end of the stage. Right okay. Now. I've spent $6,000 on training for this dog that I supposedly don't care about or don't do anything. I have all my receipts here. Um, I. The whole muzzle thing is actually a dog trainer's um, decision. He doesn't think she should be on a muzzle, she should be on a prong collar. It's more of a tool for obedience. Um, so I have her on a prong collar when I'm out with her. Um, Ms. Leary wrote in her letter that Scarlett was described as fear aggressive when she escaped five rings. In January, um, Skylar was on the loose for over 24 hours, being chased through the woods by about 40 people. Um, they were all trying to help, but she was scared and apparently in fear, and she never attacked anyone. She ran away in the other direction every single time. 
It was actually a contact at Missing Dogs Massachusetts that suggested I need to get everyone to stop chasing her. And I was actually encouraged to use the fear aggressive wording by an expert to keep away, people away so that Scarlett was to settle down in one spot and we could catch her. Her escape from five rings was not anything to do with me. I was not there, I was not even in the state. Um, it was a, it was an unfortunate mistake by Mike um, McCurtain, and um, I, I don't blame Mike. I mean, he, he tried his best to find her, and uh, but at that point we decided that I wanted something probably a little more professional um, from a training standpoint. During my walks with Scarlett in our neighborhood, I consistently avoid confrontation. If I see people walking on the street, I cross to the other side, or I turn in the opposite direction. I use these moments as training opportunities and work on correcting her behavior via the prong collar or making her lie down on the ground. Again, it should be noted that she never got away from me. So, um, and she's never hurt, other than jumping on someone's arm, she's never hurt anyone or any other animal. She did not grab my little dog by the neck. She snaps at him. They snap at each other. They both snap at each other. Dogs get irritated with each other, but she did not, she has never harmed my little dog. There's not a mark on him. Now, many years ago, Andy did run up to Mike Leary when he was mowing the lawn. And I believed at the time, and still do, that the lawnmower was what had unsettled him. Mike said it did not break the skin, but today he's saying it did. So I, don't, we, I asked him point blank on the spot when it happened. But we left it at that. Throughout the years, Andy has regularly been around children. Um, my daughter constantly had friends over. Um, Andy went on camping trips with the Cub Scouts. We took vacations. Andy stayed with friends who had little kids. Um, and there was not another incident with the Learys until July 2019. And I had never seen Andy act aggressively with a child until that day. Um, you mentioned the other boy, but he was like a five foot 10 adult looking teenager. He wasn't a child per se. Um, and I think Ms. Larry has left out a large part of the story about Andy because in May 2018, when I talked to Laura Howe, I took it very seriously. Andy has, I've always had Andy on a leash since then. I do open my gate and put Andy inside my gate and shut the door. It's never been a problem. So I think that's really kind of like picking hair, like just really harassment, if anything. Um, I did find out, however, after that incident in May that my son Aiden was not using a leash um, and that Leslie was videotaping him. Um, Leslie, Leslie videotapes us a lot um, and it's quite disconcerting actually. Um, but when I found out, when Laura called and said that she had videotapes of Aiden, I sat down with Aiden, I explained the consequences. He's a teenager. He thought he knew better than everyone. Um, he was 14 years old at the time. And since then, we have not, until this day in July, we have not had a single incident. We have had, I have had him on the leash every single time. There have been, and Laura Howe said to Leslie that I haven't heard from you in over a year. And Leslie said, yeah, that's been good. Or at least that's what Laura Howe came over and told the police officer. And I'd also had a conversation with Mike. And he said, yes, things with Andy had been going well. So, they, he has not, I, to say that I don't take it seriously, it's, you know, the, that I'm, it's just not true. I have taken, I have not let him off leash once in all that time. And I, he wasn't off leash in, for this incident either. He was on a leash. Um, unfortunately, we've gotten him a new collar and sometimes the nylon ones loosen. Um, he backed out of it when he pulled on his leash, he backed out of it and ran over. I did get Andy back. By the time I grabbed Andy and put his collar back on, I didn't know where she had gone. She was just gone. Um, so I did, then I still had to take the dogs to go to the bathroom because I had to go to work. I did not like disappear what all this is. I still had two dogs that needed to use the bathroom. I, I, I reattached the collar. Um, I came back 
and Laura Howe was on my front yard screaming. Um, regarding how I talked to the police, I did not talk poorly to the police. That officer was extremely nice to me. I was very glad he was there because Laura Howe would not come down. And I did not yell at him. I heard her saying to him that I was refusing to ask questions. Don't give me that look because it's true. And I and I, and I said, okay, I said, I have not refused to answer. I'm sitting right here. That's all you heard. <clears throat> so I, I consider Mrs. Donna Frio's statement to be false. I also think that it was unfair for Leslie to say that these problems continued all through 2018 and 19 when she herself admitted that it had been over a year with no problems to Laura Howe. While I take the bite seriously, we will have to mention that Andy is a 10-year-old Catan de Tullier that weighs just over 11 pounds. His bite did not break the boy's skin. It was a bruise. He, is a nu he was a nuisance that day. He wasn't off leash. He got off leash, but he wasn't off leash. But he does not pose a serious danger to anyone. He's never drawn blood on anyone. He's an elderly dog. He doesn't even have a lot of teeth. They've either fallen out or we've had them removed, as often happens with the small dog breeds. Andy came to us when he was one years old. He was sickly, abused, and neglected. It's always made him a skittish dog. Uh, his trainer in the early years believed he was most likely abused by a man because of the obvious fear he showed towards men. He also showed behavioral signs of being constantly caged in that first year, exhibited by running in circles. When he supposedly charged Ms. Larry's son, he ran in the direction of a group of people, ran in circles, peed, and came home. He didn't touch anyone. So characterizing it as charging when there's no contact and it doesn't appear the dog ever intended any contact is a bit of hyperbole. The comments, she's also made comments about being slamming doors. Um, she's, made, she's made a lot of petty accusations in her, in her various letters, um, but that's her. Well, on the day that Ms. Larry's son was bit, I was on my property with both dogs on leashes. Leslie and her kids and her dog passed by and my dog started barking. And he moved backwards, slipped his collar off. The collar was, like I said, it was fairly new. I was very upset. I'd never seen him go for a little kid. Um, and at the time, I'd been doing very well with both dogs. I went the very next day for Annie's medical records for the ACO, which I have a copy of here, and to the pet store to buy a choke collar for Andy, which I have a receipt for here, dated July 3rd. Within a few weeks of the incident, we started working on the stockade fence that surrounds my backyard. I invested over $1,000 in this fence. Receipts are also here. My now that the fence has completely enclosed my backyard, my neighbors have barely seen the animals for months. They have only been in my backyard. So once in a while, Scarlett goes for a longer walk with my son but, or my brother-in-law. During this time, I've also been harassed by Leslie in other ways, um, including calling the police and lying to them about my brother-in-law tearing up the Conley school grounds, which the police then had to come out and go to the school grounds and see that they weren't torn up. If I can, let's, let's stay with, okay, with but I mean, thoughts. there's a, there's definitely that's, a pattern okay. of that's harassment. That we're, we're okay. It should also be noted that just a week or two ago, Ms. Leary stood on the sidewalk chatting with a couple walking their dog. Ms. Leary was having trouble controlling her dog and the other dog was visibly agitated. Ms. Leary just continued to chat. <clears throat> the other dog did the same thing that Andy did and moved backwards to slip out of its collar and it ran right in front of a moving car. If the car hadn't slammed on his brakes, Ms. Larry would have been negligent for that dog's death because she ignored the signs. But it also points out sometimes things do get missed. She has supposedly some written statements against me from people I've never met. I would object to those statements. They're not here and I don't know them. I don't even know 
I don't know anything about them. So there's nothing to say. They're not just their friends or something. And they're not here to answer any questions. I do have just a few questions. Um, so you mentioned that you have um, you have fencing in your backyard. Yes. It is your backyard completely enclosed? Completely enclosed. Okay. Is there, um, so the dogs are now in your backyard and they don't have any way of, of no. escaping, basically? No. Okay. It's a um, stockade fence, so it's like six or seven feet high. I don't know. Um, and there is not a section that is open. And you mentioned that you have um, purchased different collars for the dog. As you mentioned that yes. the, young, the, the small dog. dog is able to slip out of a collar. So have you, you purchased So I got a him a choke. Collar? Yeah, oh. I have the receipt here. Or maybe a harness might be. Yeah, there, I tried the harness. Really... He slipped right out of it. He's very little. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they don't work. The choke he doesn't slip out of. And the, and the bigger dog uses the heavy prong mm -hmm. choke collar. There, there are all different sizes. I have a very small dog. There, there are all different sizes of harnesses that they can't Yeah, I tried one and it, it didn't work. I, I know that the choke works. Mm -hmm. um, if I can find another one, that's fine. I was, But it's hard to know which one is going to work. Does any member of the board have any questions? I have a couple. For Ms. Brady? Uh, Scarlett's the bigger dog, the Shepherd Mex? Yeah. Okay. Assuming, yeah, I guess. She's, no license? She's in my, um, I paid for both their licenses. I stopped on the way up here, and they, do re they did recognize that I had paid for both, but when they did not have um, Scarlett's information on file, and that's why we didn't get the license, but I didn't know that until tonight. Because... Is that because you didn't provide a rabies certificate? Yeah, I didn't, but I also hadn't heard from anyone, so I didn't know that it was missing. For like Andy, this stuff comes, seems to come straightly. They have the same vet, so I was just a little confused at how it works, but. All right, and the smaller dog, we have three, if I got this all right, three documented bite incidents. Two. 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 One was little boy, didn't break the skin, but that's okay, right? That's Dogs licensed? Yes. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? I have a couple. Now, <clears throat> you're saying your, your backyard is totally yeah. fenced in now? Mm -hmm. uh, Has normally, been. are both dogs outside at the same time? Sometimes. In the backyard? Yeah, sometimes. Not sometimes. all the time. I mean, during the day, they're either in the house or they're in the backyard, which is contained, or you're walking the dog is the only time there's a possibility of them getting loose. Is that what you're saying? She goes to class. Like, we have another class in Boston on Friday night. Yeah, but so I mean... So I get her in the car. But, yeah, I mean, they're not out. They haven't, they haven't been out unleashed. Okay, it's and, been a very, very long time, okay, except I mean, for when he escaped the leash. Okay. Um, you walk both dogs at the same time when you walk them? Not and always. And you feel that you no, can control not always. both dogs? Huh? When you walk, you walk the dog, both dogs at the same time. When you have to walk them, uh huh. Sometimes you know, if they have to go to the bathroom or something. You know, depends I walk on my, my it mostly dog. depends on my time and how much, like, how far I right. want to go. But you walk both of them at the same time. And now I don't walk them. My son walks the bigger dog. I don't really walk them because I just go in the backyard. No, because it's kind of difficult to control two dogs. The little one's not that hard. I mean, he, he did escape his leash, but he he's. Well, it was said that you would walk one and you'd carry the other sometimes. No. I walked. For a while, my back steps were broken. So I walked like 10 feet from my side door to, yeah. to the gate to my backyard. Right. Because my main concern is you're saying your backyard is totally fenced in. The and dogs it is. are The dogs are aggressive. You've even said so yourself. Uh, there is an elementary school right there. I, I mean, um, I'm not putting aside any of your neighbors if they have issues, but there is an elementary school there. And if, in fact, if your yard is totally fenced in and contained, and they're either in your house or in the yard, you really wouldn't think there'd be any incidences of them getting loose unless when you're saying you're walking your dog and it comes away from the collar. It breaks away from the collar. 
But that which, incident happened before the backyard was fixed. Right, which means that you lost control of the dog. Yes. Now, has that situation been cured with a new type of leash so you wouldn't, you won't yes, lose Yes, I've said I have the receipt for the new collar. I bought the cho choke collar and I fenced in my yard. Yeah, because I, I really don't want to say, okay, fine, you're doing everything you can. And then a week from now, we find out that a kid in, that's walking to school gets really bitten bad. I understand that bite, it's a bite is a bite, but it's, a, it's not a real bite, it's a bruise. But still, it's the, the fear that the child has now of dog, probably. You know, I mean, think about it. So, I mean. I understand, and that's um, why I did what I you, did. You shouldn't take what happened lightly. Right. Right. I don't think the seven plus thousand dollars I've spent on these dogs is taking anything lightly. Okay. Um, I have a question. How did Scarlett get out of five rings? Was it not climbing a she, fence or anything? It was no. She, uh, Mike, you know, let her loose for a second and she ran out the front door. Um, he was very upset himself because his reputation and everything. But um, they, they really stepped up. They had everyone out looking for her until, which the, we talked to the missing dogs and mass that agency, and they said, you, you need to stop because she's just going to run further afield if everyone's chasing her. But um, yeah, it was, it was just an unfortunate accident. Okay. And then um, maybe Lisa could run through the timeline of incidents for me again, just because sure. I know it's over a couple of years. So um, I'll first I'll start with the smaller dog, Andy. Yeah. So we have a quarantine um, from September 26 of 2017. Um, that was the incident when uh, Matthew Kirby of 38 Far Street. Um, that was the the teenager who was um, he was bitten, but I, it does not say where he was bitten. Um, he, oh, according to according to the statement that we have, he was waiting for the bus. And was, was by he was actually the not waiting for the bus. He was walking past my my driveway, on the way apparently to some bus stop, but he was not at a bus stop. Okay, that, that's just a statement. That right, and I know, but she's not very accurate sometimes, and it was obviously a bite in the ankle because that's all he can reach. And the second uh, incident was July 3rd, um, although the quarantine notice says June 3rd, but it may have just been a um, date issue on that, July 3rd. Again, that was a small one, and that was when um, the uh, younger child was bit, um, and that's the picture there, the, the Larry's child was bit. And then the third incident that, this is from December 5th, 2018. That's when Scarlett, um, it just mentions that there was a, a, a dog bite uh, around 38 Forest Street. So that was the third uh, incident. Is that the scratch? That was a scratch. The, yeah, there's no, there's no medical documentation yeah. on that. The only so medical documentation that was forwarded was from Matthew Kirby, who did go to uh, Express Care. What are our two options here? I think we have two options. First, yes. first being uh, very severe, which would include taking away and uh, mm -hmm. destruction of the animals. And the second being uh, muzzling. I just I have one Any, question. Anytime they're outdoors, correct? Yes. I just I have one question for our uh, for Joe. Yep. Um, have there been any further incidents with so, um, Ms. Gardens? Like I said, I wasn't involved in that one. Um, I haven't had any incidents since then. I'm not aware of any since then. And then since the July, um, the July incident? Yeah, July, so. is that one from July. Yes. Um, I haven't been aware of anything since then. Um, yeah. Like I said, I'm not aware of. I was only present for the quarantine on the uh, 2018 the shot. Like I said. I was just there for quarantine. Um, but the dogs have been out prior to that. Calls for them. Um, and they've done return. The dogs? Or, or dog. Uh, the small dog. Calls for the small dog more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, since this, 
July. Year of July. Um, I don't remember anything since then as far as calls, but I just have a couple of that I didn't get. This is Green. I do have a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have access directly from your house in the back to the gated area, so you don't have yes. to go outside the gate? We just we got the stairs fixed. There was a few weeks where I had to walk from my side door to the gate, which is what he was talking about, and I would just pick up one dog and grab the other. Mm -hmm. But now it's but now it's straight complete out the back access door. from inside the house to inside the gate, the house to the backyard to the yeah. fenced in area. Yes, it just took a while to get all the construction. Okay, altogether. and the uh, uh, second question I have is: Do you or have you left those dogs in that fenced in area while you have left them. the premises? No, we are always with them. I don't even go in the house. Okay, I sit out there with them. I have a ten-year-old Maltese and they are very high strung. I find that it's sometimes more difficult to corral a Maltese than other smaller dogs. So I, I understand the frustration that these folks have for He's a dog like that. He's actually not a Maltese. They just keep putting that on the paperwork. My, my dog is, um, shows those kind of traits, um, and I'm on him very tightly and I've trained it pretty well, so I understand completely how Maltese operates. But um, I would, as to Randy's question about what are our options, I would um, really like to have Joe's um, opinion as to, uh, because of his work outside of being an ACO, specifics of what he thinks the situation calls for. I think that's a, a, it's a great resource for us to have. I think it would be helpful to just identify and, and talk about the two different types of determinations for the dog. Um, we're obviously here for a dangerous dog hearing. That was what was requested. Uh, but there's two types of determinations that are available to the town under Mass General Laws Section um, 140. We have um, Section 136A um, defines a dangerous dog. Okay, I just want to read that. Is either, again, without justification, attacks a person or domestic animal, causing physical injury or death, or behaves in a manner that a reasonable person would believe possesses an unjustified imminent threat of physical injury or death to a person or of a domestic animal. Uh, the other option is a nuisance dog. Um, and under the nuisance, the statute defines a nuisance as a dog that, by excessive barking or other disturbance, is a source of annoyance to a person residing in the vicinity, or excessive barking causing damage or other in interferences with a reasonable person would find such behavior disruptive to one's quiet and peaceful enjoyment. In my opinion, under that definition, the, the two dogs do not fall under that definition. Um, the residents, the neighbors have not complained about excessive barking and noise. Um, they're Actually, the main, only complaint against Scarlett has been barking. Please let me finish. Their main concern is the um, aggressiveness and the, the bites, whether they've broken skin and caused major issue, major injury or a bruise, they're still a bite. And like I said, under the definition of nuisance, the dogs do not fit under that definition. So my recommendation would, would be the board consider whether the two dogs fall under the dangerous, the, the dangerous dog definition. Um, it may be just the one dog or two dogs, but there's some variables there that you can consider. Um, we, like I said, we have evidence and we have reports of biting but the residents are not complaining about overly aggressive barking. And one thing the statute does point out is that a dangerous dog, it can't be deemed a dangerous dog simply by growling or barking. It's, it's the physical, it's the injury, and the biting is, is what's pointed out here as, as one of the main factors, the biting that causes injury. Um, whether it's a, a, a pinch or a bite, a bruise or broken skin, it's still a bite. It's an action that's taking place. Um, and with the recommendation of Mr. Kenny. So again, Joe Kenny for representing the control. 
Um, under my recommendation is different stages within the dangerous dog. So if the dog is deemed dangerous, then there's courses of action you can take. Um, you don't have to do all of them, you can do certain ones. I think something like a uh, muzzle when the dog's walking um, and requiring confinement is a reasonable deliberation. Um, based on the fact that the shepherd hasn't bitten anyone, it does show tendencies to bite by barking in ground. Um, but we do have the incident, whether it's a bite or a scratch, um, it's treated the same way. Um, it was reported, I think, by the school nurse as a bite, so we have to take it as a bite. Um, I don't know how severe it was, and don't think it was necessarily a major bite, but whether it's jumping on people or scratching them or physically biting them, it's still enough to cause injury or cause fear amongst general people in the neighborhood. Um, that would be my concern, especially being close to a school. If it's a young kid that it jumps on, if it's if even a little dog um, that gets slips out of a leash, if you put something as simple as requiring a muzzle, there's not a chance of the dog biting someone if it slipped out of a leash. It doesn't necessarily have to be all of the dangerous dog things, but I would recommend simple steps like a muzzle for a general confinement on property. Sounds like she generally has now, but I would recommend that. So um, I get the sense that you are you're not at the stage of that these animals should be destroyed because I'm definitely against that. I think that based on the fact that she has gone forth with getting outside training and taking steps in that way, I don't believe the dogs should be euthanized. I don't think it's been something that I'd call for, but I do think that it should be restraints put on the animals to prevent further incidents from happening or to prevent down the line this event happening again. If I could, if I may recommend that um, Mr. Kenny visit the property with Ms. Varden, walk the property, make sure the fencing is adequate so that neither dog is, is able to escape. Um, that is one thing that uh, under the dangerous dog that we can recommend. Some of the other actions that we can recommend would be exactly what um, Mr. Kenny suggested is that muzzling the dogs, um, having a leather leash so that they are unable to break the leash, um, the more secure collars, harnesses, um, and something else that can be considered as well is, is a pen that the dogs can be even further closed in if necessary. <coughs> Um, but I, I would really recommend that Mr. Kenny go to the property and visual and look at the property to make sure it is, is as secure um, to make the neighbors and the children of that neighborhood safe. I like that. Does anyone? Thank, thank you, Mr. Does anyone have any uh, further questions or? I'd actually like to give Ms. Bart a chance what, um, to, to explain the, the breed of the dog because I think we keep jumping around there. Uh, Andy is not a Maltese. It's a... He's a Catan de Tulier. Okay. And 10 years old, 11 pounds. What about Scarlett? Um, she's a rescue, so her age isn't really known and her breed isn't really known. Okay. Um, the trainers think there's maybe shepherd in her, but maybe cattle dog as well. She's kind of got shepherd ears, but um, she's not easily identifiable. Um, she was about 60 pounds. Anyone have, does anyone have a motion they want to make? Um, before that, I, I'd just like to say that um, I'm an animal advocate, as most of you know. But you're a vegan. Yeah. Um, 
But <laughs> sitting in this chair, I have to be a citizen advocate, and I have to make sure that everybody feels safe in their home and their community. So I, I take this very seriously, and um, and you should too. And uh, I, I get the sense that you're trying to push the blame off a little bit on them. And these dogs are your dogs. I know and that. You I have to be in complete control of them 100% of the time. Both my dogs are rescues. I know exactly how it works. And this board has a, an obligation to protect the citizens of Forest. That being said, I think that uh, Assistant ACO Kenny can p play an integral part in making sure that this gets resolved by working with you and that we come up with a plan here to make everybody safe. And, but I can assure you this board, if anything else happens, the outcome will be very different. I get the sense from, from this board, so. I mean to say that we need to take this very seriously, and no one else should be hurt by this. Any motion? I, I just want to say, I, I echo everything Brian just said, and, and I think if people have watched these meetings, I think one of the things I've said numerous times is I take uh, the work this, this board does on everyday quality of life issues uh, extremely important. And growing up here, had a dog my whole life. It never bit anyone. There's a problem now that we have three incidents. I would never want to see a dog destroyed when without precautions being taken. But I think it's very clear some more precautions than what you are currently providing need to take place. So I would make a motion, and my motion would be uh, that the dogs uh, must be muzzled any time out of the house and that the ACO should check conditions and report report back to us. Now, and Randy, you're saying that muzzle would happen uh, in the backyard in a fence area, must be muzzled? Any time out of the house. I, I, I had a dog growing up, Dan, we had a stockade fence. The dog dug under the fence. It, it, it's very well possible. Dog can jump it does have six foot fence. And if you were to get a pen with a concrete base and chain link that you know they couldn't get out of, then maybe they could have that time. Okay. But we're talking three bites here. You're a dog owner, Brian. How many how many bites have you had? I know the chair owned a dog. Never. And I owned a dog for 17 years. Never bit anybody. Right. So that would be my motion. Yeah. I am adopting the damaged ones, but... What's that? I did adopt the damaged ones, but okay. I understand so it's not that? their fault. Randy, I'll second that. Right. Could you repeat your motion, Randy? My motion would be that the dogs are muzzled uh, any time out of the home, obviously on a leash, written in, a, in accordance to all town. Uh, bylaws and regulations, and that the ACO checks the property and for its security and safety of the neighbors. Could I ask you to add um, that, that we make sure that all required shots and licenses be added to this motion, that everything is up to date with both yes. dogs? And, and license. Yeah, the shots is no problem. They just had their checkup. Right. And, and license. Yeah, I, I just addressed that downstairs. Right. So. Okay, I, then. I'll second. You second the motion. Do anyone have any further comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. And th thank you. That's a lot. Did you want thank any you. of these things for the record?
Next thing on the agenda is the uh, town administrator's report, Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two items that uh, fall under my alter ego, the <laughs> personnel director. Uh, I'd like to announce that uh, Katrina Patton, who served the town since 2001 as administrative assistant to the police department, is retiring at the end of this week. Uh, we hired a, a part-time person to train and develop uh, to follow Katrina in her position. That is Tracy Briggs, and I would ask that the board support my recommendation to promote and appoint Tracy Biggs to the role of full-time administrative assistant level three and the chief will begin recruitment um, for potential replacement for Tracy, who is the part-time records office. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Okay, any comments, questions? No. Chief? I'm over the, uh, excuse me. Over uh, Tracy, uh, excuse me, Katrina's tenure here. Um, I get on the year before she came in, so I've only really known um, Katrina, and she's done a fantastic job over the years keeping the ship running the right way um, between payroll, payment warrants, and everything else you can name it. She knows the job inside and out, and. Um, so we're going to miss her, number one. And number two, moving forward, she has been in the process of training the records clerk to take over when she was on vacation anyway. So it just makes it that much better of a fit for, for Tracy to move up. And it'll be more seamless right. this way. And then we'll backfill uh, the yeah. records clerk in the future. But we're definitely going to miss her. So. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Actually, yeah. uh, I came to Whitman in 1972. The first class I taught at Massasoit Community College was down in the Dux at the Duxbury campus in 1972. <coughs> Katrina was in the class. Oh, wow. I've known Katrina for a long time. She's oh, great. Yeah. She really is. Yeah, she was fantastic. Thank okay. you. Any further comments on that? On a motion? All those in favor? Did we make a motion? Yes. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 That was one. That was one item, Frank. Well, it was actually two. <laughs> that was two items. Yeah. Oh, well, all right. Budget review, school district assessment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last Monday, in, in an attempt to reach out and get an understanding of uh, what the issues are here, although they're pretty obvious. Uh, we have looked at, and this board has voted to require, or at least expect, the school committee to use the statutory method of assessment. By now, well, we've, I, we've let them know that that our expectation is that they would use the yes, would make the choice to use the statutory assessment, and uh, I think Give pretty them much. Some advice. Anyone who's following this is fully aware that our expectation is that we will use the statutory method. That results in a swing in the cost uh, of the town, so somewhat over $1 million, less for Whitman and more for Hanson. That is obviously going to have an impact on both towns. And in an effort to get a dialogue going, Mr. Lamatina and Mr. Evans and myself met with um, Laura Kemet, Matt Dyer, Dyer, and Mary Marini over in our office actually to talk about what the impact is and how 
we are going to approach it. Uh, there have been suggestions made to modify how the assessment would be applied in the first year. Anyone who uh, watched the school district discussion a few weeks ago will recall that uh, Chairman Hayes had suggested a movement in the assessment of a third, a third, a third over three years. Uh, we did not get into that kind of a discussion. We simply wanted to understand what their sense was of this situation. They have acknowledged that the expectation is the statutory method will be used. The question becomes, um, will it be fully imposed in year one? Uh, will there be some movement? And I, I don't know that we're ready to answer that question right now. I do know that the impact will be significant, but the impact over the last several years has been somewhat significant to it. Um, I suppose if there were movement on Hansen's part uh, to recognize the requirement that fiscal 21 places in a statutory method and both towns adopted it, there might be some consideration in the future, but we're not there yet. I'd just like to actually clarify the letter that we sent uh, uh, Bob Hayes, chairman of the school committee, was that the board voted unanimously to request the school committee use the statutory method. Right. So. Um, because it, it, is the, it is the school committee's responsibility to choose which, mes which method they would use to assess. It can be. It can be, or can it, be. It can be a two-step can, can two process where the town also does it, um, which, as of right now, there are a lot of uh, variables to it, let's say. Um, just to clarify, I know a good portion of us were actually at that school committee meeting when uh, Christine Lynch from Desi spoke. Uh, she did speak quite a bit about working together, being on the same page. So I did reach out to Laura Kemet, and, and mainly out of the respect for the school district and our long-standing partnership that, listen, I am very firm, as, almost as firm as Dan on this one, that we, any concession or movement off of this, we need to be very clear is is affecting our, our taxpayers at that point. But uh, I've always felt you don't need to slam a door in somebody's face. It, it, it's always better to have it open and have some dialogue and see where that goes. And like Frank said, I think we're only at the dialogue portion right now. But. At the end of the day, if we can go back to the school committee and say we've tried, but we're just not going to come to a conclusion on this that we'll both agree to, then at least in fairness, we can say that. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part of the assessment issue is we're trying to put a budget together for 2021. And at this point, we don't know what the schools recommended assessment is. Um, we had a presentation at the Budget Override Committee last night that Mr. Lamatina will get into, but essentially it says we're at a very pivotal point financially and what we can do in the future depends on how sustainable our budget is. And what's not sustainable is eight, nine, and 10% increases year after year. Um, <clears throat> the schools need to understand that if we had to impose a budget today, we would probably be talking level budget, level funded budget without any uh, adjustments to our 
appropriations and to the assessment and to the other things that go with it. So there's a lot at stake here, and we really need to get an understanding from Whitman Hansen as to how we get to a point where the year after year budget process is sustainable because close to double digits isn't. And that was very eloquently made by uh, Mr. Madden yesterday. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us and it starts with getting more dialogue and more information from the schools. Um, do you want to talk about the... Uh, I would say they recommended that a um, committee be put in place. Jim? Yes. Yes. I know there's two chiefs behind me. Yeah. <laughs> <Mr. King. laughs> Steve Boyce, 39 Beale Lav. Um, a member of the school committee, not an officer or anything. And um, this is my sixth year serving. I'm not here to represent the school committee, but I am here uh, exactly as Frank and, and Randy were just starting to get into, and Justin. Um, we have come up with a committee, informal, whatever you want to call it, but it's the two town administrators, one or two selectmen from each community, and uh, one or, Two school committee members, uh, Vice Chair Mr. Scriven and our Chair Mr. Hayes. And the idea is to keep that communication going in discussion. Um, I sat back and listened at our last three meetings, and then the heat started to rise under my collar when, unfortunately, uh, and everyone's got the right to speak, but was a former Hanson Selectman who's been against us since day one. And to, what he was trying to bring wasn't doing us any good. And it was just not in the place, in the atmosphere. We need to work together. It can't, there's no separation. I was on Hanson's side for a little while there. I was feeling bad. And I, I, I appreciate everyone's efforts, Randy, going on and, and bringing forward, you know, the realization and listening to Mr. George. Um, you know, he's spot on with everything he says. But we know it's, we're educating the kids. That's our first thing. And obviously, we're looking to do that with, with the best bang for the buck. We're not trying to go overboard. We're not trying to do miracles. We're not trying to stand on our head. I sit on the Pilgrim Area Collaborative. I sat on the North River Collaborative, uh, both as um, members of the Board of Trustees. You know, I do want to see these kids learn. But oh, going all the way back to second grade, I've worked with kids that were had Down syndrome and were in a separate classroom. Um, you just want to see them succeed and get out and be us. Um, but I know we need to probably do this kind of quickly, but this discussion just can't lay to rest. We've asked the superintendent for a number of um, sort of reports, but not official budget numbers, but give us something so that we can look at. I think Ms. Kemet was very good coming forward, um, you know, speaking on, on behalf of her board, I'm sure, and, and probably most of the town. It was getting us moving in the right direction. I, I fell badly. If I got that million dollar bill, and I've sat across the hall plenty of times as chair with million dollar water bills and other things uh, that have sat on desks, um, it, it would be a tough thing. But then let's work it so it's not as tough as many think. Um, and so you all know where I stand. I'm pretty sure you all know what I do and how I feel and so forth. Um, you know, there's a lot of heroes in the town. I think you guys make up a good number of them, including Frank. Um, it's been 20 years that I've been doing something for the town. So I just, I just appreciate the opportunity to participate, but we've given that to a, a smaller group so that at least the, that work can begin and can spiral forward. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Can, Steve, I, what? do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think Sorry. so. What, Go ahead. What's frustrating to me right now at this point is magnifying the need for 
more discussion about a very simple issue. The complex issue is how to get enough money for the schools to do the job that they need to do. Div figuring out whether or not Hanson pays this year and Wooten pays that year of a limited amount of money is not the it's not the end at all. It's the very beginning, and it's what, whether you decide on a revision of that of that old agreement or the statutory method of assessment, um, that's a decision that should be able to make, be made fairly quickly. The real work is going to be once we try to figure out what the schools need and what we need to, 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 to fund them. I think what's going to be necessary, I, well, I think what's going to be necessary, but it's only me, is th there needs to be in order for this town to remain sustainable, in order for the schools to be ones that we can be proud of, there needs to be some sort of adjustment in our tax rate. There needs to be, eventually, an override that will deal with this issue. The more that, the more that we have discussions like the ones I, I saw at your last meeting, which was a continuation of discussions from meetings before that, the more we have those discussions, the, 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 least, the less likely that, that, gonna, that that's ever gonna happen. It's, it's just it's just as frustrating as heck to me. Um, Randy has done an incredible job with our override evaluation committee, and his 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 work with um, his st uh, suggesting that, that we have that meeting with the selectmen from 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 Hanson and the town managers was was an excellent one, and it has us moving in a direction. To, but to set up another to set up another committee to make a simple decision. Which is statutory method or the agreement or the old agreement that uh, kind of blows my mind because it, it, it puts <coughs> off the work that we need to do and the work that we need to do is to, to come up with a, with a, not only a budget for this year which should and the budget this year should correct some of the inequities of the past few years because they are inequities there's no doubt about that. Um, and it's not it's not Whitman looking at Hanson and trying to destroy it. It's Whitman saying, you know, give us back a little bit of what you took, what, what was taken, not what you took, but what was taken. Um, and then maybe we can get to the serious work of how to come up with a with a uh, a situation that's sustainable over the next three to five years. But that that first step. That, Committee's okay, nice little committee, about 22 people, but <laughs> we have to get over that. We have to get over that really quickly, and there's no there's no need to spend a lot of time on that. I don't think. Okay, see if it come. Um, I was on the uh, the uh, <coughs> committee, but, but I, I I loved what you said last <coughs> after sitting quiet for right. such a while. It was, it was good to hear you, Steve. I, I was on I was on the committee that looked at the original agreement, and we cleaned up a lot of the. Stuff that that needed to be cleaned up. One of the things that we didn't look at is, and I, and I'm probably guilty of the fact that I didn't think that we'd probably ever do that. But how to deregionalize? Not saying that we would ever deregionalize, but at least a doorway or a way of doing it was not mentioned in it because I thought, well, with sense, it's going to cost so much to do it that we'll never do it. Or as they put it, if we're only two towns, if one steps out, we're deregionalized automatically. All right. The second one was the the assessment way. You know, whether alternative or statutory, was never ever brought up. I was under the assumption that we were doing it the same as South Shore Votech is doing the statutory method, but I found out later that we weren't. That it wasn't being done. That there's two boxes and there's either alternative or the statutory, and the alternative method was always checked off over all these years, since the 90s. So I think the, the former committee, there's only two issues on that regional agreement that need to be dealt with. One is put something in there if we want to de-regionalize, and the option of statutory, it's automatically statutory option of alternative, depending on town meeting vote. It's that simple. Right, and as I said before, this possibly three, you know, a third and a third and a third. I'm sorry, as I said at the meeting, um, I'm not in that favor of that. I probably would never vote for that. 
because when we were trying to give Whitman and Hanson 6% and Hanson come out with 8.5%, they didn't consider us. We only could afford 6%, but they gave the 85 We had to come up, and department heads had to do what they had to do. So I'm saying, you know something? It is what it is. It's that simple in my mind. Sorry. Good. I just, so don't, I want to, I just don't want to go too far down. I know it. I know it. Too far down that, but that's, that road of, you know, Hanson, you're bad. No, I'm not, no, no, I'm not saying Hanson's bad. I am just saying that's what it sounds like. that there was no consideration Sounded by Hanson up. looking at us. But now Hanson wants us to consider a, th a third, a third, and a third. That's all. Well, to be fair, that was a, a proposal by the chair of the school committee, not right. by, by the right. uh, not by Board of Selectmen. Right. But um, and let me just say... What town's you from? Hanson, I know. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just say, um, it reminded me, we do have a fiduciary responsibility but to um, work on behalf of the taxpayers and the citizens of Whitman, and Whitman only. Um, that being said, I'm, I was the one that made the motion about the statutory, that we should send it to the school committee. Um, I don't think we have any choice in the matter. That's the way it should be. Um, I think it's a very simple uh, resolution that the school committee could do at their very next meeting. Uh, that being said, that has to be done. The small committee, I think that that big 22 committee thing is out the window. The, the two selectmen, the two from the school committee and two from our, our committee, is a good idea about the method of who pays what out of what pocket, and I can understand that. I'm with you, I think I'm not for any kind of uh, deferment, um, but I think we have to keep the option open because the end result is we don't want to get to the one twelfth budget and then possibly receivership. We don't want those. Those are nuclear options. So we need to keep that in mind along the way. But yeah, I think right. we have to keep, uh, stay strong at what we need to do for our budget as the report that you, you sent to us about your, uh, your the expert there uh, coming forth with the report that um, this is part of that process. If we do not keep our nose to the grindstone and go forward with, with anything possible to keep our finances correct, we've already st steered off the path. So th this is all connected. And, and it starts with them voting and then the small committee may be getting together and trying to come up with something. I don't, I'm not necessarily that optimistic, but we should try. And I think it is to do a couple, do exactly what Dan said, to put, basically so we have a regional agreement. Right. Um, which, according to the DESE person, uh, is, is something we do need. Um, at the end of it, listen, I, so, you know, I was on the front line of this charge of, of going statutory, yeah. and and I stand behind it. I think this this town needs to, but yeah. there are a lot of reasons why it needs to. There are, there are more reasons why it ought to happen. Yes, and I, I think it, it it's a benefits the partnership if if we can at least talk. Right. And, right, and that's my hope. Yeah. Like I said at the at the school committee meeting, I said, you know, we have to wake up with each other in the morning. So it's a reason we have to, you know, a divorce is not a very good scenario. Right. Yeah. Uh, let, let's recognize that the region has value to both communities. It's not you don't throw the baby out with the bath. One thing that we found to be very helpful in this analysis process was engaging a CPA analyst to come in and look at everything, to look at our numbers, our process. And in fact, we, we've extended that responsibility one more step. I'm sending him all of our financial policies, and I'm asking him to review those with an eye toward keeping everything as best we can. But what occurred, I think, to both the representatives in Hanson and ourselves was the value of that audit is opening eyes. And I think we should consider a similar process 
for Whitman Hansen to have, have an auditor come in and analyze the district, how it raises, how it spends, how it assesses, and get an independent look that's not interesting um, um, influenced by the interests of either town or the region itself. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I, it, I, I don't know how well that will be received. Is that but. something that we could um, get in together with Hanson, both of us commission this together. That's our thought. And and, and and independently, away from the region, come up with the answers. Uh, because I think if well, both towns do it, I think it, the it, it, it's much more credible, I think, with both towns. The region would need to cooperate on something like that. Right. Yeah. Do you have another meeting scheduled with the group that, that met a week ago? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, but we have to... Uh, just make sure that we're going to proceed with the current members that were there. Or, okay. Uh, yeah. This be a formally formed meeting with the school committee or school committee members? Yeah, or this is I, I think that they just have to, that this board probably has to present two people. I, I, I know that Hitch is doing that tonight. This, yeah. the, the purpose, and I want to be clear for anyone who's out there who thinks we <laughs> might have violated the open meeting law. This was a working task force. It was oh, right. two selectmen right. Right. from each town, not a quorum, yeah. two town administrators. We felt that it would be helpful to have a unscripted dialogue mm. and to sound off to one another. And it was helpful. It was effective. Result. More so, I think, than holding a joint meeting. Mm -hmm. And some of the ideas that we're talking about now came out of that meeting. And, and you have another meeting scheduled? Uh, not, no, we, we talked no, about no, having another. I'm sorry, confusing committee, sir. Not with that. There's group. only three. How can you be yeah, confused? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So is this is it the um, sense of the board that we want to go with that six person, two school committee, two from Hanson, two from Whitman's board? To have they asked? Have they asked for a couple of people? They have, a, a, from my recollection, the last meeting, I thought they voted yeah, we've already got the to vote. have a oh, committee have made up of vice chair. two selectmen, oh. All right. two school committee members. Yeah. You have your guys. In other words, you have your two. You have two well, we have, yeah, it's a, it, uh, we're saying it was our chairman and our vice chair, yeah, just right. to keep things simple. And then the two, two town select administrators and a selectman from each town. Yeah. Six people. Eight eight two selectmen from each town. Two, 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 two selectmen yes. from each yeah. town? Okay, yeah. eight people. And the, the town administrators would be non voting. So it's not, we have to choose, we have to choose two. Yeah. Just yes. to get to them. Two or two. All right. Okay. And we meet again December 11th. December 11th. Put aside your holiday parties. Come out to a meeting. December 11th. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Um, it, just before, any, I, I, no, I just want to get in there. have the floor at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to go along on that little working group we had, I, I think what came out of that may not have been in a, an agreement on assessment methodology. But I think being able to vocalize, we share a lot of common concerns with Hanson. And what Frank just mentioned was one that they want to work with us on. Um, so I, I would recommend we go down that path. And I think it would be ben beneficial for the audit of the, 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 having an independent audit of the schools. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, it's, and, it's easy for a couple of selectmen from each town and a, and a couple of town managers to say we want the school to have an audit. Well, under DESE regulations, we are able to call for that, that the member towns, the uh, appointing authorities of each member town could can call for that. Would that be an audit conducted by DESE? Well, it depends. Right. If you ask DESE to do it, there's going to be a time element that yeah. may not. I haven't it's my concern. reached out to them, but I'll <laughs> ask. But there's a time element associated with that. And that means we're probably looking at late spring, early summer, as opposed to we select a consultant yeah. who can go in and do the things that John Madden did here mm -hmm. with an eye toward, with a focus. 
that is strictly on numbers and strictly on process. Be more expedient. Probably. Okay, and how would we go about getting this accomplished? Um, I'll reach out to Desi tomorrow to find out what their timetable is. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's way off, uh, with the board's permission, I'll reach out to Mary Marini mm -hmm. and see if we can get together and start looking for someone. And of course, I'm going to talk to the superintendent. Well, yeah. <laughs> that, would be, that would be nice. And see if we can come up with a plan. Okay. One of, it, one of the issues would be finance because we're going to have to pay for it. Yeah. I think it'd be money well spent, though. Okay. Randy, are you ready to give you a report? <laughs> Well, should we take a vote to um, make a motion so that Frank can whatever. authorize Frank to authorize it? Sure. Whatever he just said. Someone, someone, make a motion. I'll oh, make that motion. Sorry. Which, what motion? To, to enable Frank to reach out to Desi to determine look at timeline Desi and, and then at reach out to the Hanson administrator. <laughs> Actually, I think the Hanson folks are the administrator, didn't they? Yes, I think they did. I don't know when he's starting. I think they did. Yeah. Okay, there's a, been a motion on the floor then. It's been seconded. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Do you have any volunteers for this? Not me. Oh, for the other one. We have I, a, I might have suggest a. the chair and the vice chair, much like the... Uh, no. <laughs> the school committee. You don't want me on that committee. <laughs> actually, I do. <laughs> I, I actually recommended you too, Dan. No, you don't want me on that committee. Did you? Yeah, he did. <laughs> Are you making me go with him? <laughs> <laughs> they cancel each other off. <laughs> oh, it, it could, we could do them. You want to go? No, I don't want to go. You don't want to go? No. Right. Well, I guess we're nowhere dead. Okay, which one of you two jokes wants, wants to, uh, <laughs> would like to do? You're, you're pretty... You've been as involved in this as anybody. Yeah, but you've been decent tied up. Yeah. yeah. But you, I'd, be, I'd be happy if you came along. All right, I'm in. All right. <laughs> I'll make a motion that uh, Chair McCall and Selectman Lamatina uh, are the agreement contingent of this, of this subcommittee. Of this committee that I had already spent about 10 minutes saying for the first no say I got it. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very ironic. I'll we'll be second. Happy to have you. I will second that. <laughs> All right, that's going to be a fun meeting. Do you know when it's when the, when you're going to meet? Well, we meet December 11th, but this yeah. I think this when does that four look? meeting needs to meet much sooner. Like start <laughs> like the tenth, like tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing at three tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> With well, your, who's with your, with your, so, so who's, I don't think we officially so who, voted that, by the way. We haven't voted. No, no, I just called for members. A small group. Yeah, six of you. Three. So somebody, somebody from your committee is oh, going to contact whichever two people we we. Uh, Choose. So, and I like Mr. Hayes dearly, but I think he's been caught in sort of like, after every meeting, okay, we'll continue this. And that's why I think we got a little caught up. So at the last meeting, that's why it was said definitive, this is really what we need. And I'm surprised you haven't heard from someone yet, but I can put a little bug in their ear tomorrow morning mm -hmm. and tell them. Um, can I just hear somebody yell? Who is the vice chair? Uh, Mr. Scriven, Mr. Chris Scriven. Chris can reach out to the group, the four or six members or whatever they are. The yeah, I'll, I'll ask them. It's the school committee that's, that's asking for that. That's what I'm saying. He's it's, a, it's the school committee that's developing this other little subcommittee. The subcommittee of the school committee, right? Yeah, but and they've already asked, created it. Yeah, they've created it. They're just looking for names. Right. Okay. And we, yeah, and, and we just they have your names that can reach out right, and try and right. schedule something. And just, I just wanted to know when that was going to happen, yeah. who was going to do it. And again, I think it's all, it came off of that, uh, Laura speaking up and, and Frank and Scripted. Randy at our last meeting. I think that got us to the smaller yeah, group. Randy. I'll make the call. I'll, I'll look. you call. <laughs> I'll look and I said, yeah. <laughs> all right. So we need a, there was a motion. We have to vote on it? Yeah, I don't think there's been a motion on the members. No, do we need a motion or do we just... I think we've established who the members are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're going you're gonna to contact me. You're going to be the contact. I'll contact. All right. All right. Yay. Okay. Uh, Next item. 
Yes, the Budget Override Evaluation Committee. All right. Uh, as many people know, um, the town hired a consultant, and last night he gave his uh, presentation. What he gave out as a written portion was a draft document. We are going to get a formalized draft document Thursday. I will distribute that to the committee members sometime Thursday night at the latest early Friday morning. Uh, Frank will get it, and I'm sure uh, we'll review it and review and post appropriately. Uh, I will try to go over this somewhat generically. Uh, basically, the consultant looked into state aid, local receipts, our tax levy, and came up with a variety of percentages. Uh, what we are seeing in trends, it, we are, we're experiencing minimal state aid increases over the last five years, averaging about 2.9%. Uh, However, our assessment increases over the last five years are increasing about 3.12%. Uh, he diagnosed some things with uh, local receipts, and he feels we're almost uh, estima estimating them a little too closely, up or upwards of the 97% uh, range where we're spending, and if things are a little off, uh, we could be in trouble. We looked into uh, other forms of revenue. Um, things like free cash, which we spent a, quite a bit of time talking about. His recommendation, and it could be one of the reasons we've, we've kind of put ourselves in the position we currently sit in, is that we have tried, we've used one-time revenues to basically try to keep everyone whole. We, and, and we knew we were doing that. It's caught up at this point. Uh, we looked into other forms of revenue, uh, various receipts by other departments. Uh, along some policy changes, he discussed uh, doing uh, some different things with, with those uh, various accounts. Uh, we talked about the operating budget. Well, we know the town is only growing at about 2.9%. Uh, Five-year average on our operating budget is 4.86%. Uh, we also discussed various things about how we could try functionality issues, um, whether it be uh, steering away from uh, leasing certain equipment to purchasing certain equipment and vice versa. However, that, those recommendations are also uh, cash depending. And currently, we are not sitting in a position where we could probably utilize uh, th those recommendations. Uh, we do not talk uh, too much about the sewer water enterprise. Um, he kind of felt like that was uh, handling itself, running fine on its own. Um, Basically, with some some policy things, uh, he said he, he did commend us for getting through some shaky times and, and doing what we had to do. It just the one-time money can that well has essentially run dry, and we need to get away from that. We need to do things that we uh, increase revenue and. We discuss various options that are going to need to be discussed further um, between the, the Finance Committee and uh, the Override Committee and then ultimately this board. The bad news is he estimates us, and uh, I'm reluctant to speak on this number because I did try to reach out to him today, and I don't know exactly what um, budget numbers he used plugging into this, but he uh, estimates we're about a million and a half dollars short in the operating budget. Currently, we sit relatively free cash heavy, but again, we need to get away from that. 
Uh, he estimated a very large five-year number, barring some substantial changes, um, which still needs to be talked about. The, the number was kicked around to five million. Again, uh, I don't know what. I need to see his full document to see exactly the budgetary numbers that are into that. So I, I don't want to. My comment last night was, I think we have people calling their realtors right now. So I, I don't want people to go into panic mode. But the the concern is very real, and I think we all knew that. I think a common um, statement last night was we, you know, a lot of these things we knew. I don't think we wanted to say them publicly. He was confident that with certain changes, we could work our way out of it to diminish that override number, but it appears that that might be likely. Another common concern, and I really stress this one, is what's the sustainability factor? And that hasn't been determined yet. At this point, any override would be kind of throwing cash at a problem without really knowing how long is that going to get us through and have we made the proper uh, corrections within the budget that we're not this is not going to be the patent uh, whether it be three or five years yeah the, the 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 sustainability piece is really a wild card because we're looking at capital expenditures that is significant we have free cash that can be used for one-time expenditures. The capital investment is not a one-time investment. The plan that the Collins Center provided calls for us to come up with $1.2 million a year in levy capacity, in in revenue, not, not free cash, not anything else, uh, in order to meet those needs. And over time, it'll come into place. Well, that's an easy math calculation because we don't have 1.2 million. So if we were going to do that, that's, that's the minimal override. That's what we have to do to set a budget that's sustainable. But the key to sustainability is knowing that that money is for one purpose only. And that's one of the challenges because we could vote an override this year for 1.2 million in capital. Next year we can say, well, it's 1.2 plus 2.5%. Somebody comes along and says, wait a minute, I need 700 of that. Town meeting votes it. We're done. So there's got to be a, a commitment on everybody's part to work through this. As soon as the report is finalized, I'm going to distribute it uh, to all boards and committees all of the employees, and I'm going to put it on the web because we have to face the reality that if we want to function tomorrow and the day after, we need to start working on it today. It just, you know, I, two years ago I stood up at a town meeting and said, this is the last time we can do this. Everybody said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened the next year? Mm -hmm. Came back and said, uh-oh, we don't have the money. Yeah. yeah. Hello? And, and I just do want to add just one more thing. I don't think the, by any means, that the consultant point a finger at a certain department. Obviously, we can look at the school and say because they're the, the largest number, that, that that's the one that st sticks out. It, it, it was growth in a numerous amount of areas that really is over what we're taking in. At the end of the day, we've diagnosed uh, our new growth of being about a million seventy dollars, and that's. And right now, we probably have three million dollars in requests for next year. Right, and this this does not include the statutory for the no, school no, it's not. It's or a straight budget right. based right. on what we've been doing and what we yeah. are looking at for or this the year. sustainability going forward year right. after year of their budget. Right. You know, the, you touched on that, but I think we need to make it clear that any shift in assessment is not going to make a difference in our budget process because we can't say, well, 
the other side's paying a million, we can pay less. Yeah, you can. We have to meet our commitment year right. to year, right. and we cannot reduce an assessment right. Right. because of the statutory amount. Right. So we, we've got a lot of work to do. Right. But Thank you. it's out there now. And for want of a better term, what's been happening over the past uh, few months with Andy's committee, with the Collins report, with what's going on at the schools, is the beginning of a writing of a, of a strategic plan that makes sense. Correct. It's not in writing, but it's the beginning of what we need to do. To have it. And they're all connected. Policies, is policies and procedures, gifts and gifts funds, gift funds, Frank? Okay, um, this issue came up too much because of an expenditure that had some uncertainty associated with it. I asked our council to look at the uh, permissibility of using gift funds, how, when, and everything that goes with it. The end result is you have a, uh, report, a legal opinion in your package and you have my recommendation for a gift policy for receipts and expenditures that adequately identifies how gifts are received, how they are to be acknowledged, how they are to be uh, maintained, and how they're to be expended. Uh, also included in your package is a old but timely bulletin from city and town that identifies what a municipal expenditure is. And just want to be clear, all gift funds, once they come into the hands of the town, are municipal money and cannot be spent in a way that other municipal money cannot. The only exceptions is we can do honorariums with gift funds that meet the intent of the donor. So we have a little bit of work to clean that up, but um, we recently have had uh, incidents where expenditures were made that may not completely comply with this process, and that's the reason for seeking the policy. You're not you're not expecting a vote tonight on it. No. Just I wanted like to introduce first, it. First reading. I'm gonna circulate it once you've seen it to the department heads so that everybody's had an opportunity to read and review it. Anyone have any initial questions? New business. Corporate resolution for lease purchase. There are two items that the board needs to do in order for us to complete the lease purchase of two vehicles. Unfortunately, they have to be read as a motion, so with the chair's permission, <laughs> I'll read it with the hope that you will all move and vote it. Uh, the first is a lease resolution relating to the master lease agreement dated February 10th, 2012. At a duly called meeting of the governing body of the lessee as defined in this agreement, held on November 19th, 2019, the following resolution was introduced and adopted. Be it resolved by the governing body of the lessee as follows. Determination of need. The governing body of the lessee has determined that a true and very real need exists for the acquisition of the equipment described in Exhibit A of Schedule Number 15, dated November 6, 2019, to the Master Lease Purchase Agreement, dated as of February 10, 2012, between the Town of Whitman as lessee and Tax-Exempt Leasing Corp as lessor. This is to purchase and equip two motor vehicles for police. Approval and authorization, the governing body of the lessee has determined that the agreement and schedule substantially in the form presented at this meeting are in the best interest of the lessee for the acquisition of such equipment and the governing body hereby authorizes, approves the entering into of the agreement and schedule 
By the lessee and hereby designates and authorizes the following persons to execute and deliver the agreement and schedule on lessee's behalf with such changes thereto as such persons deem appropriate in any related documents, including any escrow agreement necessary to the consummation of the transaction contemplated by the agreement and schedule. And the authorized individual would be me as town administrator to exercise the lease document. In addition to the authorized individuals above, the governing body of the lessee further authorizes the following individual to sign any payment requests and partial acceptance certificate form or any final acceptance certificate. Francis J. Lynham, Town Administrator, Lisa M. Green, Assistant Town Administrator. At adoption of the resolution, the signatures below from the designated individuals from the governing body of the lessee evidence the adoption by the governing board of this resolution. And it is now uh, complete with the signature of the chairman uh, and the attest of the board's clerk. Okay, is there a motion to so move? Second. Second. All of, any questions? Can you, can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, Randy. What? What? <laughs> can you repeat that? I missed part of it. Um, I actually do have a, a question on this. So one of the recommendations of the Collins Center and Mr. Madden going forward was to stop lease purchasing. Uh, this people. is something that was approved before okay. we went into this. They, they recognize that. Okay. It's in the plan. And actually, Mr. Madden suggested last night that based on our cash flow, until we make changes, we may not be able to purchase outright. Yeah. So. Okay. Just wanted. To, yeah. Did we vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Second resolution is a little easier. We are purchasing the vehicles, but we are purchasing the equipping of them from third parties, lights, radios, computer technology. So what will happen is the leasing company will fund the entire purchase, but we will have to pay for the equipping of it and then get reimbursed. So whereas the Treasury Regulation Section 1.150-2, the reimbursement regulation, sets forth the rules for determining when proceeds of tax-exempt obligations are deemed spent for purposes of applying sections 103 and 141 through 150 of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 as amended, including the arbitrage yield restrictions and rebate requirements under section 148, if the proceeds are used to reimburse expenditures made prior to the date of issue of the tax-exempt obligations and Where's whereas... Mike, where's Mike Seeley when we need him? <laughs> True. I'll try. Whereas the reimbursement regulation requires a declaration of an official intent to reimburse the expenditures, declaration of official intent, be made not later than 60 days from payment of the original expenditure and that an allocation in writing evidencing use of proceeds of a reimbursement bond to reimburse an original expenditure be made within 18 months after the latter of the date of the original expenditure is paid or the date the equipment is placed in service or abandoned, but in no event less than three years after the original expenditure is paid. And now, therefore, it is resolved that the computer, radio, and telecommunications equipment to be purchased and installed in the vehicles to be lease purchased under authorization made this 19th day of November 2019 shall be considered a part of said lease purchase, and the cost of these items shall be reimbursed to the town of Whitman from proceeds of this lease purchase, signed by the Board of Selectmen. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion. <laughs> Don't say everything. I want to know why, when you write out 18, you, ha you have to put 18, the number, in parentheses after. You don't need one. I don't know. I don't know why that happens. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So, those Aye. two Aye. signatures Aye. will yeah. put us in the position of Aye. completing the lease. Yeah. <sighs> okay. 
Act to declare one Mitsubishi UPS an uninterruptible, uninterruptible power source <laughs> in the Mitsubishi battery cabinet as sur surplus materials and authorize the CPO to dispose of said surplus by public auction. Is so there a motion? So moved. There's a second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Act to declare outdated woodworking equipment from the old high school wood shop as surplus materials and authorize the CPO to dispose of said surplus by public auction or by other disposal means if there is no value. Equipment includes multi-stage air compressor, delta planer, powermatic thickness planer, ideal arc welder, Westinghouse welder, pausing lathe, GE table drum sander, delta 12 to 14 inch tilting arbor saw, Rockwell table saw, 1950 Furman, <laughs> Furmont generator, Berg Gibson battery charger. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Act to declare two Taurus police cruisers as surplus and to assign said cruisers to the WFD for use in training exercises prior to being disposed of. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Cut it up, huh? Discussion regarding probably burning it. Um, <laughs> discussion regarding promotional process for fire chief to establish a civil service list. Frank. Okay. Um, as you know, we uh, conducted a civil service exam last year and used an assessment center uh, in part because it was our preferred method and in part because the uh, civil service did not offer an exam. It is our understanding, due to the research done by Chief Grino, that civil service will be introducing a written exam, uh, possibly by June or July. We have called for a list for a chief of department for fire because we need to have a standby list. The two options or to go, well, there's three options, to go with an exam, to go with an assessment center, or to go with an assessment center with a weighted graded exam component. The assessment center worked pretty well for us. Uh, I'm, I understand there's some value to having a written exam as part of it, but that can extend considerably the time involved in actually conducting uh, the assessment to determine a list. Uh, we also may be put in the position where we don't have a sufficient number signing up to hold that exam. So all things being relative, uh, the board is going to have to decide which approach it wants to take to co construct a list for a fire chief. You're recommending you recommend that we do it the same way we did the uh, police chief? I am. With just an assessment center? I am. But it is obviously the decision of the board. Does the board want to take a vote on that? I mean, does the chief have a recommendation? He's in the back of the room. Yeah, he does. Uh, he shares my opinion. <laughs> we just made your recommendation, right? <laughs> That's what I thought. Is there a motion to uh, okay, do it I'll that way? That, I'll make that motion. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. We will do a delegation agreement. Act on the request of Town Clerk Don Volley to appoint checkers for the December 2nd, 2019 Special Town Meeting. And those checkers are Sheila McVeigh, Sherry Maroney, Leanne Valancourt, and Carol O'Brien. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then finally, to uh, set the December meeting schedule. Suggestions? January. Oh, well, January. <laughs> December 2nd, we'll have a meeting before the special town meeting, right? right? So well, December 2nd. Actually, we're going to have two meetings that day because the override uh, evaluation committee. Randy has called for a meeting before town meeting, so if we meet at, what was it, 5? We're, we're meeting at, yeah, 5. Uh, that, so that if we meet from point. 5 to 6.30, that will give us a half an hour before town meeting. So we're going to have a meeting on the 2nd? Yes. At 5? No, oh, oh, that's at 6.30. 6.30. Okay, 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 6.30. Okay, 
on December 2nd. Okay, uh, when's the next meeting? The 23rd? No. What, Christmas? No. Okay, Scrooge. 10 or 17. Well, no, 17. everybody's working. 10 or 17 is your option. Yeah. 10 or 17. Okay. Sure. Probably 17th. 17th? Okay, 17th. Works. Sounds good. Fine. Works for everybody? Okay. Fourth month. 12, 17. Okay. So the second and the 17th. I think that's, uh, that exhausts the agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're done.